If you turn over to the book of Hosea, we're about uh, oh, probably the twelfth verse of chapter two. Before we begin, though, shall we have a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we ask that Thou bless the study of Thy Word. We're grateful for the prophets, for the courage they had to speak boldly and proclaim Thy Word to a people in need of hearing what Thou would have them to do. And may we be as receptive to the prophet's message today as those of old should have been, but were not. And we pray that Father that bless us in our every effort to abide by thy will. And we're thankful for Jesus who made our salvation possible. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, we uh, of course studying the uh, minor prophets and they're they're called minor, not because the message is unimportant or less important than what we term the major prophets. It's just a matter of the length of the uh, books. Typically, the uh, minor prophets are much shorter uh, books than the major prophets. But they can be just as pointed as the major prophets. The message that they deliver were timely and uh, generally, as is the case when people are involved in sin, they don't want to listen to the things that are necessary for them to do in order to be acceptable to God. They just don't want to hear it. And there comes a point where uh, it's just no longer uh, practical or uh, useful to continue to appeal to someone who does not want to hear the truth. They've demonstrated they don't want to hear it. And we'll get into that uh, uh, maybe not tonight, but uh, later on where it talks about leaving the people alone, those that are given over to, over to idols. And we see this repeated in the New Testament. Even Jesus himself, when people demonstrated that they had no interest in the truth, he let them go. He did not run after them. So I think that's a valuable lesson for us today. But here we have uh, Hosea uh, speaking to the, uh, primarily, not entirely, but primarily to the people of Israel. A lot of times it's, when he's speaking to the nation, the They'll refer, he'll refer to it as Ephraim. Ephraim was the, uh, I guess, the chief tribe of Israel, but so sometimes it just stands for the uh, whole of Israel. But he also uh, talks to Judah also. But anyway, he, he's already said here in uh, verse uh, 11, or, or the little previous section here and the punishment that's going to uh, come to him he's going to uncover and keep in mind when we're talking about uh, uh, Hosea and uh, Gomer's wife and the children we're really talking about the nation of Israel you always have to keep that in mind when you talking about uh, Gomer being a uh, wife committed to a great harlotry. He's talking about the nation of Israel. And their harlotry was, of course, uh, they uh, worship idols. And it turns out that most likely that uh, Hosea's children were not his, but uh, they're children of harlotry. And so were the children of Israel. They could not be called children of God because they were given over to idols. It just couldn't be. And so he is declaring to them there's going to be uh, destruction coming their way. He, 
he says in verse 9, chapter 2, I'm going to take away their grain and it's time, their new wine. Uh, take back the wool, the linen that was given to cover her nakedness. And I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers. And we're talking about idols. And no one should deliver her from my hand. Punishment is going to happen. Sin requires punishment. It's, it is never ignored. He said in verse 10, No one shall deliver her from my hand. Destruction is going to come. And he's going to cause the mirth to cease. Feast days. They were given over to a lot of feast days, new moons, and Sabbaths. They were engaged in uh, religious exercise, but it was all vain religion. It was not accepted. And whatever mirth that they enjoyed, it was going to cease. When punishment comes, it's going to cease. And it says in verse 12, 12, I would destroy her vines and her fig trees. Now, these were important symbols in Israel. Uh, sometimes it talks about uh, sitting by your, your vines and fig trees. That's, that's a uh, symbol of peace. Of which she has said, these are my rewards that my lovers have given me, the idols. That's the rewards that the, her idols have given them. But the Lord says, I'm a, or the prophet says, I'm going to make them a forest. Now you think about some of these forests as you drive up and down, say, 59, and, and you think how impenetrable drill, impenetrable drill, you can't get through them, in other words, uh, those forests are. And in terms of growing crops or uh, grapes or figs or anything like that, that's pretty much useless. Uh, I'll make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. Whatever they produce, the, the beasts are going to eat them. You're not going to get any. She decked her, and it says, I will punish her, verse 13, I will punish her for the days of the bells to which she burned incense. Now, all these things were introduced uh, primarily with uh, Jeroboam and Ahab. <clears throat> Baal, that word just simply means Lord. Uh, and they were ascribing to a, an inanimate, inanimate object, uh, lordship. Baal couldn't do anything. And they uh, burned incense to Baal. They decked herself out with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. Then she forgot me, says the Lord. Not only did she engage in idol worship, but she forgot the Lord also. When we're talking about she, we're talking about the nation of Israel. She also forgot uh, the Lord. And it says in verse 14, <clears throat> Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her back into the wilderness, now, now, this wilderness is not, uh, in this particular instance, if you think about uh, Israel's deliverance from Egypt, they were, they traveled into the wilderness. That was their deliverance. So he's talking about deliverance here. I will bring, bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there. And the uh, Valley of Achor is a door of hope. Uh, Achor was where uh, Achan was uh, uh, did his thing, you know. Uh, but that's going to be a door of hope for these people. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt, when she was delivered, when she achieved salvation from the Egyptians. It's going to be like that. And it shall be in that day, in verse 16, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. The, the word for my master is Baal. And uh, the word for my husband is, if I pronounce it right, Ali, something like that. <laughs> you can look it up. <laughs> but he's going to, uh, the husband was a much more intimate uh, relationship than my master, if he'd used the word my master, he would 
sort of equate it with the Baal worship, and he didn't want that. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, masters. And they're not going to speak to that any longer. And they shall be remembered by their name no more. And that uh, day I will make a covenant for them uh, with the beasts of the field and birds of the air and the creeping things, ground, bow and sword and battle, how shall shatter from the earth and make them lie down safely. Now this uh, this beating plowshares or swords and plowshares, that, that uh, imagery has been used before. And he's really talking about a, a time of uh, peace. Well, he's already made a covenant with them, so what covenant is he talking about? Well, there's going to be a new covenant uh, with the, these people. It's not going to be the old covenant. He's looking forward to a, a time of a, a spiritual covenant with them. And it's going to be, uh, now that doesn't mean that, you know, once this new covenant comes in, there's going to be peace around the world. That's just not going to happen. It never has happened. People have always been at war. But for those in the spiritual kingdom, there is a peace there. There is no longer the battle with sin that's been overcome. Verse 19 says, I betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice. And it's got to be in this. There's four um, five things really that are mentioned here I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice they've got to go together you can't have righteousness without justice and you can't have justice without righteousness in loving, loving kindness that's for one another and for the Lord himself and mercy and being considerate of others in their weaknesses and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Well, God is always faithful. What He says will happen. What promises He makes, He'll keep. And so we must have the same sort of faithfulness towards Him if we want to be uh, acceptable to Him. And if you do these things, you shall know the Lord. And the fact of the matter is, you cannot know the Lord if you don't do these things. It is an impossibility. You may say that you do, but uh, it is, that's just not the case. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain and new wine and oil. And they shall... Uh, answer Jezreel. Now keep in mind that Jezreel was one of the uh, children. And the first Jezreel that was mentioned, it, it can mean either God will scatter or, or God will sow. And you may think, well, uh, in times, old times when they sowed, they actually scattered, but they're really used in a different sense. In the first instance where God will scatter, he's going to scatter the people. Uh, but when this new covenant comes about, he's going to show them anew. They're going to be uh, uh, sown for himself. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. Now, keep in mind again, these are plays on the words of the children again. Uh, mercy, Ruhama, or not mercy, is low Ruhama. He said, those who had not obtained mercy, low uh, Ruhama, they're going to have mercy. And I would say, those who are not my people, that's low Ami, they are my people, Ami. And they shall say, you are my God. Now, uh, the, these particular verses, as uh, was the case, and I think, uh, oh, the 10th uh, uh, verse here. It was quoted again by both uh, Paul and Peter. Paul in the uh, ninth chapter, about, about verse 25 and 26 there, and Peter in First Peter, uh, uh, verse, uh, chapter one, verse ten, and it's distrim, distrim, uh, demonstrate 
uh, what he's Paul's trying to demonstrate that the Gentiles were now included in this and and uh, Peter was demonstrating that Christians are the ones who are his people you are my people that's the Christians the saints and they sh uh, they shall say you are my God so it's different than what uh, the these uh, uh, people of Israel were doing In chapter 3, the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who took to other gods and loved the, the raisin cakes of the, of the pagans. Now, keep in mind again, this is a comparison of what he's telling God, uh, Hosea to do and the nation of Israel. You've got, always got to keep that in mind. So who is this uh, loving woman who's loved by a lover? Well, in Hosea's case, it's in a good case can be made that it's actually Gomer. And uh, of course, in the case of Israel, it's Israel who has committed adultery. You know, the Lord still loves Israel and uh, wants them uh, to return. And these uh, people, uh, they loved other gods and they loved raising cakes, things that they at least thought the, uh, these inanimate gods uh, provided. So Isaiah says, I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and, a, one, and one and a half uh, homers of barley. And he said to her, You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot. You shall not have a man, and thus I will also be toward you. So he's not going to be a, a uh, husband to this wife that he bought, and she's not going to be a, a wife to him. And again, that's the, uh, the imagery with respect to Israel. Uh, God is going to buy Israel again, but there's going to be a time when they will not be a wife. You know, if you think of uh, God as the husband, Israel is not going to be the wife for a period of time, a long period of time. And uh, he says in verse 3, And I said to her, You stay with me uh, many days, he said, no, you should not have a man. There's not going to be any conjugal relationship. And I will be the same towards you. For the children of Israel, verse 4, shall abide many days without king or prince, without uh, sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. After the children of Israel shall return, seek the Lord their God and David their king, and fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Now, there's going to be a period of time when uh, Israel is taken off into captivity that they're not going to have kings or princes and they're not going to be able to offer sacrifices or have any, uh, uh, any uh, manifestations of uh, uh, scriptural worship. They're not going to have that. They're not going to have priests or anything like that. They're going to be in captivity. And being in captivity in a... Uh, pagan land was very disheartening to an Israelite. They couldn't properly worship in a foreign land like that among uh, Gentiles, in this case pagans. And when they're talking about uh, the children of Israel are going to return, seek the Lord their God and David their king, well, it's not going to be David the, the the historical David. It's not going to be that. It's going to be a new David. It's got to be talking about the uh, time of the uh, uh, establishment of the church, the Christ. And, and during that time, they're going to fear the Lord and His goodness in the latter days. These, these are going to be latter days. In verse 4, or chapter 4, rather, 
Hear the word of the Lord. Again, it's the Lord speaking. You children of Israel. The Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. It's almost like a uh, court scene and the, uh, the, the state or the prosecutor is bringing a charge against these people, laying a charge against these people. The charge, there's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Any time in any land where there is no knowledge of God, that uh, nation must eventually fail. It may be a long time, but eventually it will fail. And what did they do because they had no truth, mercy, or knowledge of God in the land? By swearing and lying, killing and stealing, and committed adultery, they break all restraint. Well, what is it that restrains, restrains a people from engaging in all these things? There has been an absolute standard of truth. Once that is abandoned, then, then what's to uh, inhibit all these things from taking place? There's nothing to inhibit it. Uh, they break all their strength with bloodshed after bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away. With the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and even the fish of the sea will be taken away. That means everybody's going to suffer. Everything is going to suffer. Now in verse 4 it says, Let no man man contend or approve there's no use for a man to contend or approve because this is going to happen it's past the point of no return for your people are like those who contend with the priest now the priests were the, supposedly the uh, uh, proclaimers of the law the, the keepers of the law make sure the people uh, obeyed the law and so forth so when you're contending with a priest, you're actually contending with the law itself. Therefore you shall stumble in the day. The prophets shall stumble with you in the night. So both the uh, priest and the prophet are, are both going to stumble because they, they, uh, uh, they have abandoned God. They have no knowledge of him. He says, and I will destroy your mother. Now, think of mother here in the context of the nation of Israel. If you think of Israel as the mother, I will destroy your mother. That's the one who provides all the, the good things, you know. Of course, we have a mother today, don't we, that provides all the good things. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And you have to have knowledge in order to be faithful. You cannot be faithful in the absence of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being priest for me. So he's speaking primarily to the priests. They're the ones that, uh, in theory anyway, that they had the knowledge of the law. And they should have been preaching that law, be sure that the people complied with that the law. Um, but they didn't have the knowledge of it. And because they did not have knowledge of it, and when they did hear it, like from Hosea, they rejected it, then therefore the Lord is going to reject them from being priests for me. They may still hold, in secular terms, they may still hold the office for priest, but in terms of what God approves that they are no longer priests because I will reject you from being priests because you have forgotten the law of your God then you know the consequence is I will also forget your children well what children of the priests were well, those that they taught and that's the people of the nation of Israel the more they increased, the more they sinned against me, and I will change their glory into shame. Now, there's some question about uh, who is it that increasing here? Is it the priests or the, the children, the people? Well, it doesn't uh, really matter, I suppose, 
uh, if you increase the people, you got to increase the priest. And the only reason the priest increases is because there's increase in the people. So, it, you know, take your pick. Uh, the more they increase, the more they sinned against me. And you have to think that probably they're talking about the priest because uh, the more people sin, they have to offer sacrifice for their sins. And who gets a cut of the sacrifice? It's the priest. So they, uh, they want the people to sin, so they have to make a sacrifice for it, so they get a cut of it. They're lying in their own pocket. The more they increase, the more they sin against me, and I will change their glory into shame. It should be a glorious thing to be a priest, but it's going to be, it's going to be turned into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They, they like that. They set their heart on their iniquity, and it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways. So they're all going to be punished. And we reward them for their deeds. Deeds bear a reward. I don't care what kind of deed it is. It bears a reward. If it's an evil deed, it's going to bear an evil reward. And if it's a uh, good and wholesome and righteous deed, it's going to uh, bear that kind of reward. For though they shall eat, uh, but not have enough, they shall commit haltry, but they're not going to increase because they have ceased obeying the Lord. So it's essential that uh, there be obedience in order to enjoy these other uh, things. Harlotry, wine, new wine, enslave the heart. Anything that operates in contradistinction to the word of God, it enslaves the heart. Verse 12, it's my people ask counsel from their wooden idols and their staff informs them. You might uh, recall, uh, you know, the witchcraft or what have you. Soothsayers, you know, they would uh, all take, it takes all sorts of uh, manifestation, but in this particular case, you know, they have a rod and they're trying to divine something, you know, trying to determine what's going to happen to this. And they let the rod fall, and depending what direction it falls, you know, they would have some sort of interpretation of that. Not that they hadn't already decided what it's going to be, but anyway, that's that's what they're talking about. Uh, and their staff informs them, for the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray. This idea of uh, idol worship has caused them to stray. And they have played the harlot against their God any time one even today, you know, any time uh, there, there's some substitute for God in your heart, then you've played the harlot. They offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills. A lot, a lot of times this pagan worship would happen on, on mountaintops under uh, hills and what, high places, under oaks, poplars, and terebinth trees because their shade is good. You know, everybody wants to do whatever it is they want to do under the shade. <laughs> everybody likes shade. Therefore, your daughters commit holotry and your brides commit adultery. And this was actually happening at the time. They were engaged in these uh, really horrid uh, types of uh, activities. And as part of their worship, the daughters were committing uh, their prostitutes religious prostitutes. But he says in verse 14, I will not punish your daughters when they committed harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves, and remember, uh, men are supposed to be in charge of all this, uh, the men themselves go apart with harlots, and these are, these are ritual harlots, and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. they for people who do not understand will be trampled. And the people didn't understand that this was not acceptable, so they're going to be trampled. Though you, Israel, play the harlot, again, they engaged in idol worship, 
let not Judah offend. Do not come up to Gilgal. Gilgal was a uh, kind of a center of idol worship. Now go up to Beth Avon. Now Beth Avon is Beth El. Now Beth El means house of God. And Beth Avon just means house of uh, futility. Now swear an oath saying as the Lord lives. It's not going to do you any good to, to do that. For Israel is stubborn like a stubborn calf. Now the Lord will let them forage like a lamb in open country. Now calves are uh, supposed to be penned up and so they can, one thing, so they can work. But Israel doesn't do that. It's stubborn uh, like a calf that you can't can't use in any sort of work. It doesn't do much good to have a, a yoke of oxen and you can't, can't get them yoked. You can't get them to work. Now, if he's going to let them forage like a lamb in, in an open country, uh, I remember when I was in graduate school, I had a uh, fellow student there that came from Big Lake, Texas, which you know is out in West Texas. His, his family owned at a junction, 20 sections of land. And they ran sheep. So he knew about sheep and lambs. And he told me, I'll never forget it, she had a, a sheep was born looking for a place to die. And a lamb out in an open uh, pasture out running around did not have long to live. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let them alone. Now, Ephraim, of course, stands for the nation of Israel. And they were joined to idols. And you couldn't convince them to change. So leave them alone. Just get away from it. You're not going to change them. Get away from it. Their drink is rebellion. You know, if they, if everything they do, the drinking, eating, and Whatever it is, it's rebellion. It's in disregard to uh, what God would have people them to do. They commit harlotry continually, and this is both spiritual and, of course, they did uh, the physical harlotry too, but it's talking about spiritual harlotry, worship of idols. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. Those things that are dishonorable, the rulers like that. The wind has wrapped her up in his wings. Now, uh, think of Hurricane Harvey when it was blowing through here. Of course, Nancy and I were in California, so we didn't have to worry about that. But anyway, uh, think about when the wind was blowing. Did it encompass everything? It encompassed everything. So the wind, this uh, hurricane that's coming, is wrapped, it's going to wrap these uh, people up in their wings. No escape. And they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. And their sacrifices were not in accordance with um, the instructions. And once all this happens, they're going to be ashamed of that. In chapter 5, hear this, O priest. He's directing this, of course, to the priest. Take heed, O house of Israel, to the nation. Give ear, O house of the king. Of course, talking to the king. For yours is the judgment, because you have been a snare to Mizpah and a net spread on Tabor. Their voters are deeper, deeply involved in slaughter, though I rebuke them. So they're going to be caught in uh, the, uh, their own snare that they've set and the net that they've spread out. And the revolters, those that are revolted against God, are going to be deeply involved in slaughter. And of course, it doesn't matter. They're going to rebuke them all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. 
You can't hide from God. You can't do it. For now, O Ephraim, you commit holotry. Israel is defiled. They do not direct their deeds towards turning to their God. For the spirit of harlotry, idol, idol worship, is in their midst. And they do not know the Lord. Now they say they do. Because they engage in all of this idol worship, they really don't know the uh, Lord at all. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Now, the pride of Israel, you know, you might think, well, that, that should be the Lord, but it, it could also be their vanity. And uh, think of it as their vanity. They testify to his face, therefore Israel and Ephraim stumble in, in their iniquity. And uh, Judah also stumbles with them. Now, Israel, of course, is the nation of Israel. Ephraim is the largest tribe of Israel. And in Judah, of course, is the nation, the southern kingdom. They're all going to stumble together. With their flocks and herds, they shall go and seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. It's not because he's not there. It's because the way that they're seeking. They're trying to do it on their own terms. He has withdrawn himself from them. They have dealt treacherously with the Lord. And they have, for they have begotten pagan children. They have, their children are as much involved in idol worship as they are. Now a new moon shall devour them and their heritage. Blow the ram's horn in Gabea. Uh, ram horn is always uh, a symbol of something is important is going to happen or calling people to a conference and so forth. And the, the trumpet in Rama, cry aloud at Beth Avon. Again, that's a house of uh, utility. Look behind you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I make known what is sure. And this is an important lesson that uh, the Lord always warns ahead of time. And when he's, he's talking really here about the, the destruction that's going to come from uh, Assyria, and it's going to later on say that it is Assyria that's going to do it. Uh, when he says, look behind you, Benjamin, well, well, Benjamin's in the southern kingdom. He's not part of Israel. You know, if you recall, Benjamin was almost completely destroyed because of uh, wickedness. So what is uh, Benjamin doing looking behind him? If Benjamin was close to the border with Israel and he looked behind him and he saw the Assyrians coming, he, you know, he needs to be uh, uh, warned about that. Ephraim's going to be desolate, and they were desolate. Ephraim standing for the nation of Israel uh, is going to be desolate in the day of rebuke. The rebuke's coming. And the Lord's going to be, make sure they know it's coming. Verse 10, the princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. It was uh, not permitted to remove landmarks in the, uh, in the promised land, if you can call it that. So what landmark are, is Judah moving? Well, it's the landmark of right and wrong. They were moving that. I will pour out my wrath on them like water. Ephraim, the nation of Israel, is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked by human precept. Therefore, I will be to Ephraim like a moth and to the house of Judah like rottenness. Now, how does a moth work anyway? Kind of gets you into your clothes and you go pull out your favorite wool coat and it's all eaten up. They, they work insidiously uh, internally and it's going to happen without you knowing it. Ephraim is not going to know it. But they're going to be eaten up uh, like a moth. They eat, eat, eat up a woolen coat. 
And, uh, of course, Hash and Judah are like rottenness. Uh, the, the, the punishment of Judah, of course, will come much later, but uh, the rottenness was already apparent in, in Judah. So let's, we'll start with verse uh, 13 of chapter 5 next time. Thank you for your attendance. And good night.